Okay, Santiago had a question on how to compare the analytical with the numerical solution for the part where you are asked to plot the error against the grid resolution. This is the idea of a grid independent solution, how to check that. And um, the best way to do that would be if you have the analytical solution, which you can evaluate at any grid point, mm -hmm. and the numerical solution, which is available only at certain grid points. So if you're doing, for example, 19 grid points, calculate the analytical solution at the same grid location as, as where you have the numerical one. And take the difference between the analytical and numerical one. So you will have a difference vector which contains the differences at every one of the grid points. And then take the norm. Okay. okay. If you take the norm of the analytical solution and then the norm of the numerical solution, what you're doing is, it will also be okay, but it will give you a measure of the comparison of the averages. Okay. Right. Whereas you want to make sure that it agrees at every point. So this is probably a better way. And dividing it by the norm of the analytical solution is a good idea because it scales the problem appropriately. <coughs> So how are you guys doing on the assignment in uh, Petroleum Institute? We have same question, okay. Did I make that clear? Did you understand what I was trying to do? Sort of a 
VPN to access the PA network from outside and you can check out the licenses. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure what we can do. The problems that they're facing is uh, there's a spring break coming, so some of them are going to be going outside of the institute. Okay. How do they work on comes off from outside? We will probably have a similar question here, but we have a solution for that. Right. Yes. <laughs> but, but Cisco doesn't apply for them? The um, same. They, they, actually, that's a possibility too. Like you could point your licenses to our machine if you can, because you have an LSU account. So using that, you can log into our VPN just like you can log into our portal. And then you'll be able to check our licenses. But when you are installing Comsoft on your PC, uh, you need to make sure that it is pointed in the to our servers. You guys have, you are lucky you have two weeks spring break. We have one week spring break <coughs> starting um, on I think March 29th or something like that. Yes, and um, let me just, uh, I just looked at the schedule this morning. <coughs> so <coughs> our spring break starts on March 29th and we reconvene on uh, 8th. April 8th. So there will be no classes during that week. And uh, <coughs> after that week, we will continue. And uh, if you are not able to join because you are on your spring break, I, I did not think through all these issues when I I just got <laughs> excited about offering the course for instance, and playing with it. And uh, next time, I'll be more cautious to see how we can handle these uh, time difference, daylight time change and then these spring breaks that are not coincident. <coughs> so at the end of this course, we need your input, the four of you uh, brave souls to <laughs> participate in this experiment. Um, and we need to talk to the for time to see what worked and what didn't work, what lessons we can learn. Okay. <coughs> Okay, <coughs> are there any questions uh, here from your assignment? Are you guys doing all right? Um, yes. Is there any difference between VVP 4C and VVP 5C? From a functional or utilitarian point of view, there is no difference. They both solve boundary value problems. They use different algorithms. One is able to handle what you would call differential algebraic equations. The other one doesn't. But if it is a boundary value problem, both of them should be able to do it. And the underlying theories uh, we will hopefully cover in this course. <laughs> I still have a large agenda to cover. So <laughs> I'm not sure how far we are going to uh, be able to cover all those. But at least I open the doors for you guys. <coughs> We have come a long way in this course so far, I think. Uh, we started off from ground zero, a very steep learning curve, uh, starting with direct methods, iterative methods, LED composition, uh, conjugate gradient methods. At a conceptual level, and we did see the algorithms also, so you, you are kind of exposed to the thought processes that go into developing these algorithms, and then dwell into nonlinear systems. And today, I'm going to cap that off with what I call the 35,000 feet view of the problem uh, that people are studying in the literature, or were studying, I guess, in the 80s and 90s. And uh, that's the kind of problem that you will be looking at in your project as well. So this lecture should give you an idea of what to focus on when you're reading these papers. And each paper, remember, is probably based on a PhD thesis and worked on for a couple of years. These are really solid papers. I picked five papers for discussion today, and maybe in the next class. I'm not sure whether we'll be able to finish all five today. Uh, <coughs> Let's start recording. Okay. <coughs> uh, so it is going to be uh, an overview type of lecture today, and maybe next lecture. So there, there were very detailed ones that we went through to actually give you the ability to write your own program for doing these bifurcation analysis, continuation methods, 
stability, etc. Uh, but we all focused on a very simple problem, two equations from a CSTR, and in your case, uh, maybe 20 or 40 equations from the Brato problem. But these problems are all pro going to be uh, arranged in such a way it's going to be progressively complicated in terms of the spatial variation. They're all driven uh, by fluid mechanics. Okay? So after all this, we call it as a computational transport phenomena. You will see today why we call it as a computational transport phenomena. Because all of them deal with transport processes. All of them use computational, very advanced computational methods. <coughs> I guess I put three and then I changed my mind. I added two more. I should have changed it to five. <laughs> okay. So that's five. Uh, the very first problem uh, was published, I think, in 1990 in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. Journal of Fluid Mechanics, mo most of them are from Journal of Fluid Mechanics or Physics of Fluids. These are the two top journals in the field, uh, in the field of fluid mechanics. And uh, this is a paper that talks about dynamical behavior of natural convection in a single phase loop. So I'm going to describe what the problem is, how they approached. So we'll go through some of the key elements in the paper how they approached it, and what kind of results they looked at, and what sort of tools they used. Okay? We'll go through that for each one of the uh, five problems. <coughs> so often, in undergraduate course, the question would be, is this going to be in the exam? <laughs> and the answer <laughs> is, um, co concepts from these, because we're going to have an oral exam. Okay? So I will try to kind of explore with you uh, what it uh, Erhard and Mueller study in their paper, okay? So these five papers I want you to take a look at before the exam so that you have some idea. And of course, the focus will be on your own project. And what I want is for you to pick in your project 10 papers related to your topic and do a, a chronological literature survey, highlight what they found, how the field has progressed, and pick one paper for your detailed simulation. And I've given all these requirements in the suggested uh, time frame that I put this morning. Okay. So the problem that they study actually comes from nuclear reactor uh, modeling. Okay. So what they have is a circular tube. Okay. <coughs> which is heated and cooled with an outside medium. Okay. So the inner one is the one that contains, it's a closed loop. Okay. So it's, that is, heat is being generated in one section of the nuclear reactor and it is being transmitted and taken out. The nuclear reaction produces the heat and you want to take it out uh, with a cooling fluid. So there will be <coughs> a cooling fluid uh, on the out, outer side. Okay. And they wanted to understand the dynamics of what would happen to the situation. Okay? So think about it. Conceptually, what would happen? If I have a fluid in the inner part that is completely filled, but that is closed, there is no inlet or there is no outlet. <coughs> okay? And that is an angle that I'm going to set up. I'm going to call that as theta. Okay? <coughs> so I'm heating from the bottom and I'm cooling from the top. What does your intuition tell you about what would happen to the fluid in the inner closed loop? When I, the, the whole thing is exactly horizontal. Now I'm going to then ask you to think about what would happen if I rotate this whole setup by 2 degrees or 5 degrees or 10 degrees. Okay? So initially what would happen? And when you rotate it to the right or to the left, Okay, so this angle is going to be a parameter in the problem. Okay, so what would you expect when you heat a fluid from the bottom in general? We talked about this in the tra transport course, and I guess those... Have you guys done a transport course in PI, transport phenomena? <coughs> okay, so you have done natural convection, right? Convection that is driven by buoyancy force. <coughs> Maybe there is a variation. Some people have, some people haven't. <laughs> Currently doing it. Okay. Uh, 
So you, you will see what we mean by natural convection in that course. Okay. So what would happen if you look at the fluid at the interface, at the interface between the top and the bottom? It's just one phase, single phase fluid, as it says. Okay, single phase loop. Okay, so it is going to be heated here, and on the upper side it's going to be cooled. So there is a temperature gradient. So the heated fluid will have lighter density, right? Mm -hmm. So it would want to rise up. <coughs> and the, the fluid here would also want to rise up because that's also being heated. So what would you, so if you, if you treat TH minus TC as your parameter, the gradient, and you're plotting the velocity in the loop, the average velocity in the loop, what would you expect the average velocity to be at very low rates of heating? Zero. Okay. So you plot the velocity in the loop, what they call V theta, against this delta T for zero angle. Okay, that means it is perfectly horizontal, the heating and cooling. Okay. So what you will observe is zero velocity. But what happens at a certain critical heating rate, that that is what you would call a conduction state because heat is being transferred only by conduction mechanism, okay? <coughs> there is a symmetry breaking that occurs because this is a symmetric problem between the top and the bottom, the left and the right, okay? So the symmetry breaking occurs and you get a pitchfork bifurcation, okay? So that becomes a stable part of the solution, okay? That is stable, that is stable, that is unstable. Uh, that is stable, I'm sorry, and this is unstable, okay? <coughs> now, we have talked about a number of other examples like this with the rod problem, for example, okay? So if I take this and tilt it by two degrees or one degree, then what happens? I give the system an advantage. If I tilt it, for example, a clockwise direction, which, which way do you think the flow will occur? Will, I'm rotating this clockwise, so I'm taking this and pushing it down. Will the flow be clockwise or counterclockwise? What is your intuition? Clockwise. clockwise, right? So it's going to, because the fluid that is being heated is going to go around and immediately start setting up a convective loop, okay? So this picture then changes to a picture that becomes like this. If the top one represents a clockwise velocity and the bottom one will get connected like this that being unstable solution. <coughs> okay, so if you tilt it the other way, the picture will unfold in an opposite direction. So they wanted to study this problem, and this is very similar to uh, what happens. Of course, it's an idealized problem because we have a circular loop. In the nuclear reactor, these pipings are all not necessarily circular, so this exactly may not happen. Okay. So that is a problem, and oh, I have the picture here. <coughs> so the center part that you see here is the one that carries the fluid and the outer one is the heating and the cooling fluid. So it was an approximate one-dimensional development with time-dependent uh, feature built into it. So what they proposed was, their starting point was they were going to consider T as a function of phi and time. What is T? T is the temperature in that channel. So the temperature is going to be a function of phi. Phi is that coordinate system measured along the pipe. So what happens to r and theta? What happens to a cross section? If you take a cross section of cars, there will be a velocity gradient and there will be a temperature gradient, but they average that velocity and temperature gradient. So they consider this as the average velocity at a point at a given Five. It's called area average model. It is derived from the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, but their starting point is they don't take you through the averaging process. They just give you here is the average time, and the area average equation, which is derived from the Navier-Stokes equation. So when you see a paper like that, you should be kind of able to identify. Okay, I understand where this term is coming from. What this term stands for. Okay, and if you want, you can sit down and uh, lock yourself up in a room and 
derive it over a period, maybe a period of day. <coughs> but um, that, that is the underlying assumption, that there is a one-dimensional problem, meaning the velocity is a function <coughs> of only one spatial dimension, and there is only one velocity, v phi, as a function of phi and t. And that v phi could be zero if you have purely conduction state, but if you tilt it like this, you will get a convective state right from a uh, very low heating rate. Okay, any questions on the description of what the problem is about? The mathematics in this gets pretty complicated very quickly. And so I want you to understand the physics and I want you to do the same thing when you're doing your project. Read the paper, the mathematics is daunting. Just step aside that and try to understand the physics of it and see where what we have learned in this course would be applicable. Okay? And this problem can be set up in ComSol very easily without going through the math that they have done. But that's going to be a fully three-dimensional time-dependent setup. Because if you're going to do what they have done as a one-dimensional problem, you need to derive the one-dimensional equations. But they have given you the one-dimensional equation. So if you can choose to take those equations without really asking how they derived it, we can then still impose it in ComSol and get the results that they have. So those are the kind of thought processes that you should do when you are working on your project. So now the theory begins. Okay. You've set up a problem, and here are the model equations. When you're writing the project report, I would also like you to follow the same procedure. A section where you identify what the motivation behind the problem is, what are the literatures, the 10 papers that I've asked you to identify, and then followed it by a section that identifies what the model equations are followed by a section that identifies what are the numerical methods that you used, and a validation section where you're going to pick one figure and compare it with what you get from ComSol, with what is in the paper, and then parametric studies. Okay. So in this particular case, they say there is a literature before, so they give you some of the references, but this is their starting point, the first equation. Okay. <coughs> Let's see whether you can identify each one of those equations. I'm going to circle the equation, and you tell me, what, what do you think that equation is? Yes. Continuity, very good. So the transport course has worked, right? You know what that equation is. It essentially says that the velocity is the same at all angles, average velocity, because it's an incompressible fluid, right? So if you push the fluid at one part of the pipe, since it's closed, it's going to push all the fluid around that with the same velocity. So it simply says that d, d u d phi is equal to zero, where u is the area average velocity. What do you think this term is? Mass balance? Mass balance is this, continuity, right? Yes. Momentum balance. Momentum balance in one dimension. Which dimension is it? The phi direction. Okay, it's an area averaged momentum balance. So this term takes care of <coughs> the acceleration. Okay. And what is this term? That is the pressure gradient. Will there be a pressure gradient in the problem? You don't have a pump pushing the fluid inside. And out, out. There is no inlet and there is no outlet, right? So what if, will there be a pressure gradient? If there is a pressure gradient, what will the pressure gradient look like? Those are the kinds of questions if you ask, you will understand the paper fairly uh, quickly. What drives the flow in this particular equation? What is the driving mechanism? It's not an imposed pressure gradient, <coughs> but it is that. This is the driving force, the buoyancy, buoyancy term. So rho as a function of t. When you apply that as a linear function of t, that is what we will call as the Bosonesque approximation, okay? Where you say that this rho of t is a linear function of time, okay? Why do they have g sine phi? The gravity term keeps changing direction. Okay, so if I take gravity always acts in this way, but if I take gravity acts always down. Okay, but if I take a point here, since gravity acts down, I need to take the component of the gravity in the flow direction. Okay, and that component is going to be different at different locations. So sine phi and cos phi will give you the 
the right component at each location. Okay, and what do you think the last term is? Navier Stokes equation, you should have the viscosity term, but because it's a lumped model in some sense, so they say that is the frictional loss. So the driving force that you apply goes towards three mechanisms. Okay, the driving force that you apply, the force, goes to overcome the friction, frictional loss, sets up a pressure gradient. Okay, so the pressure gradient is not imposed, but it is set up in the problem and goes to accelerate the flow, okay? And if it ever reaches a steady state, then the acceleration will drop out, okay? But you may find that at certain times, it has an oscillation in the loop, okay? That it never reaches a steady state. That will occur through a half bifurcation, okay? <coughs> what is the second equation about? That is the energy equation, okay? Can you understand every one of those terms? The first term is the accumulation, and this is second term here is the convection of energy. Because the fluid is moving, it is carrying with it certain energy. So that is a convection term. What about this one? That is the convection term, right? Convection in the axial direction or the streamwise direction, in the phi direction. Between these two terms, what do you think would be the more important term? Convection. Convection is going to be the dominant term, right? So you can neglect this term if you choose, but they have left it here. And later on in the analysis, they will say, okay, I'm going to make lambda. What do you think lambda would be? Thermal conductivity, right? So I'm going to say I'm going to lambda is a very small number. I can neglect that. How about this term? That is the heat transferred from the fluid to the surrounding, the annular pipe that is there. Okay? So the heat transfer coefficient is going to be a parameter in that. How about this one? <coughs> that would be the heat generated within that loop. Okay? So it, it, it could be, you, you could simulate the amount of radiant heat that is added to it or the nuclear a reaction that transfers the heat to that. Okay, so that is their starting point. It is derived from the Navier-Stokes equation, and you sh should be able to derive it. Um, at, at one time, I thought maybe I'll give this as part of the assignment, but I think I want you to spend more time on your project. The current assignment is challenging enough. Okay, I'll probably give you one or two more assignments on spatial discretization because that is an important concept that you should get out of this course. But something like this, you should be able to derive at the graduate level, but that is their starting point, okay? How would you solve this? Is it, is it an ordinary differential equation or a partial differential equation? It's obviously a partial differential equation because u is a function of t and phi, and the temperature is a function of time and phi also, okay? <coughs> How many of you know about PD classification? Good, you guys are following along. Okay. <coughs> what are the classifications of partial differential equations? Parabolic, elliptic, and hyperbolic. Have you heard about it? I think we covered it in the transport course. What would this equation be classified under very likely? It is a nonlinear equation, so it doesn't really strictly uh, fall into one of those categories. But there is, if you drop this term, there is no second order term in that. So it will be something like a wave-like behavior. So it will probably be a hyperbolic equation. How did they solve it? So now the problem formulation is almost complete. They have identified what are the various terms that you need to provide. Fw, the frictional loss, Hw, the heat transfer coefficient, and Qw, the heat source in the problem. Question? Anybody here? <coughs> this is how they solve it. This is where I said the math can get horrendous, okay? So you have written down the equation, and you have a feel for where they come from. But how, how am I going to solve it? They say, okay, I'm going to solve it. Um, 
<coughs> by expanding the solution for t as a function of phi and t in terms of a series. What is the series? Fourier series, sines and cosines. Okay. So the proper way of solving this would be to, if you are going to do it analytically, see whether you can separate the variables. But to begin with, it's a nonlinear equation, so it's not going to be possible. This is a, what the numerical method of solving differential equation is about. Okay? And we will see the details again using simple equations. That will be the next phase. After I finish this lecture, we will look at spatial discretization and how we get approximate solution. But the idea here is I don't know what the analytical function is that satisfies the differential equation. If I take these two functions and put it into the equation that I have, they will not be satisfied. Okay? So what I'm saying is then, I'm going to try to find an approximate solution. That is, I'm going to see how best I can make these functions fit that solution by choosing the correct values for Sn and Cn. These are the coefficients in the Fourier series. They are functions of time. Okay. And similarly, Qn and Rn for Q5. Okay. <coughs> um, so I'm doing a Fourier decomposition of these two functions. And this is very much like what you already know about curve fitting. Okay. If I give you a set of data, okay, uh, y versus x, and I give you that this is the data, and find me a function that fits the data as best as it possible. Okay. What will you do? You will propose a function, right? And the function will have certain coefficients, and you will say, I want to find the best value of those coefficients so that the predicted curve and the difference between the predicted curve and the actual data, that's an error. So I'll sum all the errors and I'll find an objective function. I'll see what is the, what values of those coefficients minimize that error. The idea is exactly the same, except it is applied to differential equations now. Okay? So you take this function, <coughs> plug it into the differential equations that we have, and it will not, it's not going to be zero. So you will call that as your residual error in that equation. So you square that error and minimize that. So find the best values for A, uh, I mean S and C and Q and R, such that that sum of square error is minimized. This is the idea behind method of weighted residuals, infinite element method. Uh, so number of methods propose a solution with a certain function. Instead of fitting that solution to a given data, we don't have the data, we take that function and fit it to a differential equation. BVP 4C, 5C does exactly the same. Okay. So you propose a solution in functional form, and you have these coefficients, and try to find what are the best coefficients that are possible so that you minimize the error. Math, again, is very tedious in doing that, okay. taking this, plugging it in, plugging it in there and then trying to find the residual. But when you go through that, what you will find, this part you should be able to do. This is just non-dimensionalization of the variables. Okay, we have done this several times in the, the fluid mechanics course. Okay, but they identify a few key variables. One is the state variable x1, which depends on u. Okay, and the second variable is x2, which depends on the first coefficient s1. And then x3, which depends on R, R1 and C1. That's where the coupling is. Okay. So R1 and so the two equations are coupled. So the solution that you're going to get will depend on these. And when you do the series expansion for the Fourier series, you will get a lot of other state variables. Okay. They're all related to Sn and Cn. And that part of decomposition and writing this equation is not trivial, but putting them in dimensionless form where you identify what are the dimensionless, the parameters that make a particular variable dimensionless could be, uh, should be uh, fairly straightforward, okay? So when you do that, you get a set of equations. Now these, we have taken care of the spatial variation through a functional form. But we have left the time dependence as an unknown function, Sn and Tn. Okay, in this particular case, S1 and uh, C1, for example, are functions of time. 
So what you're going to get out of this is, let me ask you before I show you the next part, what will you get if I take this, put it into the differential equation, and define my state variables according to this, what will I get out of that? I will take all the partial derivative with respect to phi. When I take this and plug it into the differential equation, I will actually have to take the partial derivative wherever there is a derivative of phi. I will have to take the derivative of these functions. Okay, so that's fairly easy to do. But whenever I have derivative of time, this will appear as ds1 dt, dc1 dt, etc. Right. So that will, in this case, will appear as dx2 dt, dx1 dt, dx3 dt, etc. So I'll get three ordinary differential or a set of ordinary differential equations. And what they did is I'm going to ignore the higher order terms in the series. I'm going to take only the first three terms in the Fourier series. Okay. So it's a very sophisticated development, but ultimately they have reduced it so that they can analyze the dynamics of three ordinary differential equations. Any questions so far? How are you following? In general, the basic idea is clear, what the thought process is. That there are a lot of intermediate steps. In a good paper, you will have to fill in a lot of intermediate steps and in going from one equation to the other equation because they have developed all these things and they just give you the final result. Okay. <coughs> so that equation, set of equation, three equations, has a number of parameters alpha, beta, k, lambda, and delta. These are all parameters. What are the states? The states are x1, x2, and x3. Okay? And they are coupled. Okay? You will find states appearing in all the equations. x1, x3, x1. <coughs> so what is lambda? Do you remember? Convection in the axial direction. So they say if I set lambda as equal to zero, okay, uh, this actually reduces to the Lorentz equation. So they give you the additional equations too, but neglecting axial convection, neglecting lambda, this is the three equations that you will get. And for symmetric case, delta is zero. Delta is the angle of health, okay? Um, and constant heat transfer coefficient. K is related to dimensionless heat transfer coefficient, okay? So can you kind of guess why it is x1 to the power 3? You should know from transport phenomena again what is the functional form for heat transfer coefficient as a function of velocity. Okay, so it turns out to be uh, Peclet number to the power one third, for example. Peclet number is the velocity divided by the thermal diffusivity. So it has a one third relationship with respect to the velocity, the heat transfer coefficient. Okay, that is it makes a lot of assumption. The assumption is that the overall heat transfer coefficient between the inside and the outside is dominated by the inside heat transfer coefficient. The outside heat transfer coefficient is considered to be very high, so that there is no resistance there. Okay. So all these you should be able to kind of deduce by reading that paper and why they have chosen a particular form. And why did they choose absolute value for x1? The flow could be clockwise or counterclockwise, positive or negative but the heat transfer coefficient will basically be dependent on the velocity to the power one third, okay? And for the case of symmetric heating and uh, a constant heat transfer coefficient, so this whole thing is the heat transfer coefficient. And if you said k equal to zero, I'm going to neglect the dependence of heat transfer coefficient on the velocity. Remember, u1 is related to, x1 is related to the velocity u, as we saw in the dimensional, non-dimensionalization. Then it reduces to the Lorentz equation, which we saw earlier. Okay. Lorentz equation was also derived from Navier-Stokes equation, but the context in which it was derived was atmospheric convection. Okay, so when you have thunderstorms, there is an exchange of 
cold fluid with the warm fluid, okay? Cold fluid being at the top and the warm fluid being at the bottom as they exchange. If you go through a similar argument, going through very similar development in terms of developing a truncated model from the Navier-Stokes equation, Lorentz derived those three equations. And this, in fact, becomes equivalent to that if you make these further assumptions. But in this particular problem, delta is a key parameter. It's not equal to zero. Okay. As I tilt, what is going to happen? And that is their bifurcation diagram. So what they are plotting is there are a number of parameters. They have set all those parameters at constant. For example, alpha is 15, and delta is 0, and k is 0. Okay. But the distinguished parameter is the heating rate beta that appears in one of the equations. And what they are plotting is the flow velocity x1, the state. You could plot x1, x2, or x3. Okay. So they are plotting the state velocity. And as we discussed originally, up to a certain critical value, there is no velocity. It is dominated by the conduction state when delta is equal to zero. When you put delta equal to one, this will unfold. Okay? But for delta equal to zero, you get uh, a pitchfork bifurcation as the first bifurcation here. Okay? That remains a solution, but it is an unstable solution. Using continuation methods, they mapped out the complete bifurcation structure, and what happens is, from this point on, we have several hop bifurcations. Okay? There are lots of branches. So the problem is re really gets very complicated. The same as the Lorentz model as well. Okay? And when they say tau periodic, that means it has a periodic solution that goes through one loop or two loops per cycle or three times per cycle, and eventually leading to chaotic dynamics as well. Okay? This is a generalization of what Lorentz developed in his uh, model for the atmosphere, but with the convection loop. There are a number of other papers following this on double uh, loop convection pipe, etc. So that's basically what I wanted to expose you about this problem. The tools that they have developed, uh, used in solving this particular diagram is all the tools that we have seen. Okay? How to trace the branch points. Um, of course, to track the periodic solution, we haven't really seen. There are some really advanced algorithms there. I'm going to show you how to locate a hop bifurcation point that occurs at a particular point. Okay. What condition? We already know what condition would be put to locate where exactly is the hop bifurcation point. What did we do for a limit point? We knew that a simple eigenvalue was zero. So we just wrote that condition down. So for a hop point, we know that there should be a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues. So we just impose that as a condition. And then in the next paper or the uh, one after that, they have given the extended equation. So I wanted you to look at and see whether you can identify how they have imposed that particular condition. These guys have done the same thing. There is a package called auto, okay, and that does this automatic bifurcation diagrams. It's freely available. You can download it. And uh, it uh, solves both ordinary differential equation and uh, partial differential equation. And it's a very powerful algorithm that implements these continuation methods and various extended systems for verification analysis of nonlinear systems. <coughs> Any questions? Any questions from PI? <coughs> Remember that my purpose in exposing you to this is to kind of give you an idea of how you should approach reading your own project papers okay? um, at a level that's sufficiently deep but not necessarily being able to derive every step along the way. Um, I'm not expecting that as part of this course. If you want to do that, that's great. You will learn a lot and you will become very good in mathematics if you try to do that. But I'm not setting that as an expectation. So in an exam, again, if I take this problem, I will ask you to explain uh, what the various terms are and uh, how does this problem differ from the Lorentz problem, et cetera. All right, so the next problem. That was a one-dimensional problem. Spatially, we had only one velocity component that was changing in only one direction. It was an area averaged one. Uh, this one is one of our own paper. I had a very bright uh, student from Germany who spent one 
year with me. He had a fellowship from the German government. His name is uh, Norbert Alibon. So he was with the University of in, in, with me in the University of Alberta. And uh, we looked at a problem that was classically studied probably with hundreds of papers already before. But he wanted to learn all these techniques. And I had spent one year before uh, in his lab and uh, with his supervisor. And that is the very famous uh, Franz Durst in fluid mechanics. Um, he's now retired, I think. So we worked on this problem. And uh, I'm going to kind of take you through what the problem is. The problem is called the sudden expansion. So the geometry is this. A very common situation when you connect two pipes with different diameters, you might come, come across something like this. But this is a two-dimensional study. Earlier we saw one-dimensional, so this is uh, upping the level of difficulty a little bit. But what does two-dimensional mean? It means perpendicular to the board, it's planar. So if you extrude it, you're going to get infinitely long planes. Okay? You can do the same thing in pipe. Um, what, ha what do you think would happen if I control the inlet velocity and keep changing it, starting from very low velocity, gradually increasing it? It's again very easy to set up in ComSol. I don't think anybody picked up this as a project, but it's a very nice project as well. Okay? What do you think would happen as I keep increasing? What would be the flow profile? What would it look like? What does your intuition tell you? you will start to get what, what you see is as the inertia becomes dominant. Okay? So at certain critical Reynolds number, you might find something like this. Okay? If you draw a streamline, the streamline may be like this. And there will be a symmetric streamline at the bottom. Because I'm making the top and the bottom section the same, is exact, exactly symmetric about the horizontal axis in the middle. Okay? Um, <coughs> And as I increase the Reynolds number, I might find that the separation distance, the length of the vortex, may become larger and larger. Okay? And so I have a jet that is shooting from. What would happen to the fluid that is caught in this regime? I cannot escape that, right? because that is a dividing streamline. So it will just go along, uh, fl flowing along like this, whatever. And remember, perpendicular to that, it will be the same thing everywhere. So I will have two velocity components, Vx as a function of x and y, and Vy oops, y as a function of x and y, and 0. Okay, That's why we call it a two-dimensional flow. There are two velocity components that depends on two of the coordinates. And here I'm going to call this as x and this as y. So what are the equations that are governing this? The classical Navier-Stokes equation, the continuity equation, and the momentum equation. Okay? And you have to expand this in two dimensions. Maybe I have it written down later on. But what happens in this particular problem, which was discovered experimentally, okay, is as you increase a critical, again, you can plot the behavior as Reynolds number against the vertical component of the velocity at the center line. What do you think that would be? B. B is the vertical component. So what would B be as a function, Vy, as at, uh, for any x at y equal to 0? What should that be? If the flow is symmetric about the center axis, what should the velocity be? 0, right? So you will find that the flow is symmetric up to an announced number of, I don't remember now, about 110, 120 or something like that. But once you exceed that, the flow becomes funny. It changes to something like this. So the separation on one side is smaller. The separation on the other side is much larger. It breaks the symmetry. Why does it happen? That's nature's way of hiding its secret from us. That's what I tell. All the secret is hidden in this equation. Right? So it spontaneously happens that it breaks the symmetry. Then this was observed experimentally, and it's called the Coanda effect. Okay? 
this was done in the 1930s or so. And people have then experimentally measured and characterized what the variation in the velocity using laser Doppler and Robert. Durst, in fact, is one of the founding fathers, I guess, of the equipment of laser Doppler and anemometer. And uh, so in his lab also, they measured what the velocity field is. That's why when I was in his lab, we talked about this, but when that student came, he took that and uh, did a wonderful job. But if it happens like this, it goes down, one can also argue, why doesn't it go up, right? And it does, okay? So that's where you get that symmetry breaking. At a certain critical value of the Reynolds number, the profile becomes asymmetric, and whenever that symmetry breaking occurs, there are always possibility of <coughs> both points. It can go either up or down. What is the reason for that? The reason for that is this equation has that symmetry. So if I take this equation and make the substitution that x comma y, x comma y, is equal to x comma minus y. What do I mean by that? Wherever you have x in this equation, replace it by minus x. Sorry, minus y. Wherever you have y, replace it by minus y. That means uh, along the symmetry line, if I take a point up, I have a similar point down. And I'm trying to see whether there is any relationship between the velocities uh, of these two. So what would you expect the u velocity to be at the top point and the bottom point? be the same. They don't change sign. Okay? So you will get u v at that location as equal to u comma because u is the same. After this coordinate transformation, u is the same. Right? What would happen to v? If the v is going up here, it must go down there. Right? So v will become minus minus. So wherever you have v in this equation, put minus v. And what you will find is that the equation doesn't change. The equation remains invariant to this transformation. And that's what tells me that if I have an equation with, with a flow that is going down, and if I subject that to this transformation, I will flip. And I will get the upper solution. So I don't need to solve for the second one because if the equation remains invariant to this, if I have a solution for this, I just take the solution and make that flipping, and I will get the other solution. And those are the two solutions that we have. This solution remains as an unstable solution to the navier stokes equation. So one of the questions that you asked is, if it remains unstable, can I calculate it? And the answer is you can if you use a Newton method and continuation method. Okay? But can I find it experimentally? The answer is no because it is smallest perturbation will cause it to go either to this or the other one. Okay? So this is an example, nice example from the literature where there are two stable solutions and this is an unstable solution and this is a stable solution. And uh, what did he do? What did Norbert do? So he put this as the inlet velocity. What does that tell you? It's a fully developed parabolic profile as it enters the tube. And then we are going to see what happens. <coughs> and this is how we define the distinguished parameter, the Reynolds number in our problem. And this is the transformation I talked about. And when you subject the equations to this transformation, the equations remain invariant. That tells us that if there is an asymmetric solution, it must occur in pair. This is a technique that we talked about, I think, by introducing the stream function, because it's a two-dimensional problem. In fluids, we saw that we can always introduce a stream function and a vorticity. Okay. Vorticity definition is this, and the stream function definition is this. So you can get rid of pressure. That's the basic idea. You can get rid of pressure with these and reformulate the problem in terms of stream function and vorticity. Again, a little bit of algebraic manipulation, but you can uh, reduce the problem to solving this equation the vorticity equation, okay, and I think the stream function equation is written here. These are the two equations we are going to solve for the two variables, stream function and vorticity, in two dimensions, x and y. Okay, so these are the equations. They are partial differential equations. Obviously, we are looking for steady state solutions. There is a dynamical part also, okay, but we are looking at the steady state solution. So how do we solve it? 
for this particular problem, we basically use something called the finite deference method that I'm going to talk about later. later. So in the circulation loop problem, we basically use the Fourier decomposition of the solution, proposing that solution and then finding the unknown coefficients. Here it is finite difference approximation. So this is the mesh that we use. And you are now already with uh, Brunner's uh, introduction to ComSol. You know how to pick your meshes. Wherever there is steep gradient, you put more mesh points to get an accurate solution. And we will see why that is later on when we do the discretization itself. So symbolically, we represent this discretized equation like this. Okay? The stream function and the vorticity at every grid point is the unknown. Okay, so these are the unknowns. And these are all the parameters in the problem. The gap, the distance between these two, Reynolds number is the distinguished parameter. But we can also change these parameters, the length L1 and the length L2, etc. So we have, a, after we discretize this, we get a set of algebraic equations. Now we can use all the tools that we have developed before to lo look at this bifurcation analysis of this. The only thing is, n is a very large number. We went and used uh, probably up to 40,000 grid points. That means probably about 80,000 uh, equations to be solved. And we used LU decomposition, and uh, we used it power iteration to find out the eigenvalues, and we use continuation method and the extended systems to map out what the uh, solution structure looks like. Any questions so far? The problem itself is not very difficult. It's classic Navier-Stokes equation. You can very easily set up in ComSol. After generating the mesh, it will give you the solution. And if you just keep increasing the Reynolds number, you will find that you automatically get those uh, non-symmetric solutions. But ComSol doesn't have all these advanced algorithms for you to do the continuation unless you do the trick that uh, we all talked about, how to add the arc length equation. We have done that for that two problem, right? Yes. But using the, their own differential approximation? Uh, that is, you take a differential equation, let it discretize by its own. Instead of what we gave as an assignment right. is we discretize. Yes, yes. Then we fit in all the algebraic equations. Yes. That's clear to me how you would do that. But if it's a differential equation, can you still do that? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. I have to watch that video <laughs> to yes. understand how that's done. I, I haven't discussed prior to problem arc length in the class because it was given as assignment problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But maybe I'll, I'll do that. Part probably we have to squeeze one lecture on yes. that. that. That is a very powerful scheme. If we can use ComSol, where you let it do the discretization. Because for us, to go from that step where you have these equations to this step is one year's of work from there to here. We have to write the code. We have to debug it. And so there is a lot of effort. If that one year can be cut down to one day, <laughs> your productivity goes up tremendously. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> this is what I say. In the 50s and 60s, what they saw as a PhD thesis is an assignment of this. Because <laughs> of our uh, improvement in the tools that we have. So this is the solution taken from the paper in general fluid mechanics. A Reynolds number of 70, you have a symmetric solution. 100, you have a symmetric solution. 175, you have a symmetric solution. And 200, you already begin to see things, right? Yeah. That's, that's not quite symmetric. But if you go for 250, you see that it is quite different. And a mirror image will also be a solution. And I have that for 300, I think. Okay. So this is for 300 for both of them. This one is 300, and this one is also 300. And you will see that this length is the same as that length, and this length is the same as that length. Okay. And these are. Uh, he went on to characterize the stability. How did he do that? By using the power iteration. So everything that we have talked about, he was ab basically able to uh, implement. So this is a validation against the laser Doppler measurement from uh, their lab. And these are for the symmetric solutions along the vertical line at a particular value of x. Okay. And for a particular Reynolds number. So that shows the Navier-Stokes equation does in fact predict it without, uh, with very high accuracy. And this is one for the asymmetric case. OK? 
experimentally measured, the solid line is from the CFD. But how does the bifurcation structure look like? That's what it looks like. Okay. So the first bifurcation occurs somewhere around 210. And there is a second bifurcation that occurs around 550 or so. Okay. So this is stable, and that is stable, and this is stable. Okay. And this is unstable. This is stable. Okay. But after you cross the second one, this becomes stable. Right. So depending on how, how many such structures there are, the stability continuously keeps changing. And so we needed to track how the stability changes. Now, what is the state variable that he's plotting here? This delta x is defined as, you can plot any velocities or something, but here he plots delta x, which is the difference between uh, this. x lower minus x upper. Delta x as a state variable is x lower minus one. You cannot write very fast because it will be So if that difference is zero, that means you have a symmetric. So it's a measure of the degree of asymmetry as well. And those decisions are all made by him. Okay. So he, he, he did choose. You can choose any, any state variable. So when you're doing a project, you may want to do things like that. And here is the stability analysis. Again, when you see this, you should be able to relate to what we saw for algebraic equations. What is it doing here? This is the total stream function solution as a function of x, y, and time. Okay, And you decompose that into a steady state part and a perturbation part. So the perturbed variable are considered to be small. So you take this, plug it into the two equations that we had earlier, and propose the solution to be exponential e to the power sigma t. So sigma is our eigenvalue for this problem. So the discretized version of those equations will give you essentially an eigenvalue problem. Okay. So here y is the eigenvector, j is the Jacobian of that function h that I gave you, the discretized equations. This is exactly what you're doing in your current assignment, except you have only 20 grid points or 40 grid points. He has 20,000 or 40,000 grid points. So his Jacobian is going to be really very large. Okay, But even in the 90s, we were able to do that using direct method. Um, and we didn't have COMSOL and other things in those days. COMSOL, if you set it up as a direct method, you'll actually be able to get access to the Jacobian. I haven't really figured out myself, but it's in principle, it's possible to get that. M is called the mass matrix, which is typically an identity matrix. That is the matrix, that is the problem, the eigenvalue problem is something like this. dy dt equals um, another matrix, j times y. Okay, so in some problems, you may have this m as other than identity. Uh, but if you have, you can then still take that. And the eigenvalue problem becomes a more generalized uh, eigenvalue problem. Then you use the power iteration, because this is now 80,000 by 80,000. There are 80,000 eigenvalues. You cannot calculate them uh, even today on these machines. Okay? That's an enormously time-consuming task. So what he did was use the power iteration, and a generalized version of the power iteration called the Arnoldi scheme. And he plots here, essentially, the real part versus the imaginary part of the eigenvalue sigma. Okay. And what are you looking for? You're looking for those eigenvalues that cross and go to the right axis. That's what is an indication of instability. Okay, so again, I have uploaded all these papers onto Moodle. So you may want to look at that uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay, and this was an extra one. This guy was really good. So he said, what would happen if I take, this is for validation purposes, okay? So the, oh my God. <laughs> okay, so I have a sudden expansion like this, okay? So I can control this and say, my sudden expansion is like this, very, very large. What would happen? Then it is as if you have a 
jet that is coming here. Okay, the wall, the effect of the wall is pushed far away. So it is a jet coming into an infinitely large domain, and it's possible to use similarity transformation, what we did in boundary layer theory, to transform the Navier-Stokes equation into this equation. This work has already been done, and they actually predicted analytically what would be the jet velocity. That is, as it comes here, if you plot the jet velocity, it may be like this. But as it goes further, further down, it just uh, spreads because of the entrainment. Okay? So eventually, it will become flat. And so you wanted to verify his code, whether the code is working or not. Um, so you took that limiting case and matched the analytical result with the computer result to show that this, this program has no box. It's working well. It's capturing uh, a limiting case. So D is the ratio of the expansion ratio, okay? And the D was 1,000 here. Again, that was good enough to consider it as a uh, jet. And the solution that for that is called the Jeffrey Hamel flow. Okay. Any questions on that problem? So we did 1D, and we have seen 2D, okay? And the tools that are used are essentially ideas behind that, but for a really large system. So computationally, one has to be careful to make sure that LED composition is implemented in the most efficient way. And there was a package called Sparse Pack, I think it's still available, from University of Waterloo. It's an extremely efficient package for solving large spar sparse systems of uh, algebraic equations by LED composition. That's the one that they used. Now, this paper is by C.P. Jackson. And it introduces a finite element discretization. So we have seen Fourier series, we've seen finite difference, we've seen finite element now. We've seen 1D, we have seen 2D, and this is also a 2D problem. But the pro this is a very popular problem. I think four people have picked this as a project. So you might find it uh, interesting to uh, read this particular paper. What is the problem? The problem is flow past cylindrical objects. But he considers different shapes. For example, if I have a circular object like this, and the flow that comes around it, what would happen to it as I keep increasing this velocity, or the Reynolds number based on that velocity? Okay. What, how does the dynamics change? So these are all attempts to understand what is the transition process that leads from a laminar flow to eventually a turbulent flow. Okay, in the intermediate regime, what, signed up, what kind of uh, dynamic changes occurs. But he also considered different other shapes. What happens instead of a circular cylinder that is perpendicular to the board, it's a cylinder, right? So if I take a triangular shape and perpendicular to the board, extrude it, I'll get a triangular cylinder, right? And some of you have picked the square cylinders. And so he looked at several shapes. What would happen if I have an ellipse? at a certain angle. So this is the major axis and the minor axis, and an ellipse that is oriented differently. And all these, once you have a finite element code, these shape changes are fairly easy to handle. Okay? Again, this is very easy to set up in comes all these ways. That was the focus on the, uh, for, for this paper. So what happens here is, intuitively, you expect a very low Reynolds number, a perfect re reattachment on the other side. But as you increase the Reynolds number, you will find a, a weak a separation zone. And that weak link increases with the Reynolds number up to a certain point. And then, in this case, it doesn't go to any other stationary state, okay, like in the pre previous case. In the previous case, when we say stationary <coughs> state, the non-symmetric solutions are both steady state solutions. You can observe it. But in this case, the dynamics is a bit more complicated. Once you cross a threshold, you find these waviness. And there is a vortex shedding. On the top, you will have something like this. On the bottom, you have something like this. So the flow oscillates between the top and the bottom, shedding vortices. Okay, it's called von Karman vortex. We observed it experimentally and characterized it. But it was not until, I guess, the 80s or late 80s that it was actually computed. By, we were able to compute from. That's the time when CFD emerged because of the uh, emergence of the power of uh, computing machines and emergence of pretty good algorithms for calculating all these. So that is the focus of this paper. I'm just going to show you what the equations look like. So what are these equations? 
Maybe a Stokes equation in two dimensions. Okay, so u and v are the two velocities that you have, and it depends on time, x and y. Okay, uh, <coughs> what is the driving force in this? Is it driven by a pressure difference, dp dx or dp dy? An imposed velocity through the, through the boundary. Okay, so if you have a uh, A domain in, in COMSOL, for example, the way that you will set it up is you will have this is an infinitely large fluid domain. In COMSOL, you can't do that, right? So you will take a finite domain, a rectangular area, and you will put in the middle a cylinder of any shape that you want, and you specify this as the inlet boundary, okay, with a velocity of u. All the others will be specified to just natural boundary conditions, okay, in COMSOL. It handles, and we'll talk about what natural boundary conditions are uh, in the finite element context. Okay. You can tell me if I exceed my time okay, when I'm talking about these problems. So there are a number of parameters here. What are those parameters? Gamma is one. Reynolds number is in fact the dynamical parameter. Gamma is some sort of a geometrical parameter that you have. Okay, and here you have the continuity equation and the x momentum equation, y momentum equation. We are including the transient part, but you can drop them. In Comsol, it's very very easy. You just pick stationary, and it drops this term. Pick dynamic, and it includes this term, and it includes an automatic time integration procedure. So steady state solutions. Here is a question for you. What is this equation? How do we get this? Now we're talking about finite element discretization, but all that does is gives you a set of algebraic equations also for the nodal values. So what would x be? x is going to be a vector that packs u and v at every one of the nodal points. Okay, so if we have 20,000 nodal points, the vector length may be 40,000. But G is the equations, the discretized equations at those body points. And what is this one? You can read, it's doing graphs and iterations. Right? So the correction delta x at every iteration is found by this linear equation. So what is G of x? The Jacobian. The Jacobian of this function g. What is g? g is the discretized version of the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, that's the link that we need to see because I want you to be able to understand that process of how do we discretize it. As I said, that's the rest of the course. But when you see a paper like this, you can see that enormous amount of work goes between that step and this step. But that is fairly routine, so those have been automated in packages like Flu and, and Comsol. Okay, so that step we don't have to worry about. But n neither of these packages have these continuation methods and extended systems built into it yet. Auto is the only program that's available that does that, but auto doesn't solve the navy stokes yet. Okay, it solves simple partial differential equations, single partial differential equations. So it's good for reactor dynamics and stuff like that, but not for transport processes. So this is the algebraic equation, the discretized algebraic equation, and this is the Newton method where g of x is the derivative of g with respect to x. That is your Jacobian. And dx is your correction vector for the Newton method. And minus g is that function. So when g goes to 0, we have converged. So the correction goes to 0 as long as g of x remains non-singular, invertible. When g of x becomes singular, this method would fail. Okay, that's when you get a limit point or something like that. Any questions? Do you recognize this one? I'm going to be quiet. I want you to answer that. What is that? Hmm? Continuation. Continuation method. What kind of continuation is it? Or the Newton continuation? Because lambda is a distinguished parameter. So you're calculating the x d lambda. 
how does each one of the state variable change with a parameter? And there is a pain by using the Jacobian that you already have calculated. And this is the derivative of dg with respect to d lambda. Okay. So you need to go back to the Navier-Stokes equation and see what is lambda and where does it appear and take its derivative. Every one of the grid points. Okay. And uh, it's not a easy task, but it's not uh, impossible to do. They have done it. We have done it in uh, uh, the sudden expansion model. And this is how you will get the next initial guess by using this vector dx1 and lambda here. So that is nothing but the Euler-Newton continuation as we saw. And the purpose of Euler-Newton is exam questions for you guys. <laughs> These are the exam questions I will ask in the oral exam. What is the purpose of uh, Euler-Newton? It, it provides a good initial guess by extrapolating <coughs> the current solution along the time vector. Okay, so the purpose is to provide a good initial guess for the next value of the parameter. What do you think this one is? <laughs> this is the dynamical equation. Again, they put M, uh, the mass, ma what they call the mass matrix. But this is the, fill in the blanks. This is the, linearized equation of the nonlinear equation. This is the full nonlinear equation that you see here. And this is epsilon is the, so they use different symbols, but the idea is the same, right? So that is a linearized version of the nonlinear problem. And then you propose a solution for epsilon in terms of to the power, so epsilon is treated as e to the power sigma t. Okay, and that is your eigenvalue problem. So, what is psi here? Eigenvector. Sigma is the eigenvalue, and s is an m is the mass matrix, and gx is the Jacobian. Jacobian of the original function. So it's the same idea, just compact form, but there is a lot of programming that goes uh, underneath this. Oops. So the next real test for you comes here, the extended system for locating a hop verification form. That's the reason I picked this particular paper. Okay. What was the requirement for a hop verification point? Imaginary. You must have a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues. Okay. So here is your original problem, lambda is the distinguished parameter. We want to find out for what value of lambda we get exactly a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues. <coughs> okay. So look at that and see whether you can understand and explain that to me, what is happening with the remaining equations. I'm talking about these equations. And identify how many unknowns there are in the extended system, what are you solving for, and what is the physical meaning of each one of them. That one. Okay, what is the physical meaning of each one of them? Anybody wants to take a guess? Treat M as I. M is the so called mass matrix, but let's treat that to be identity matrix. Eigenvalue has no real part. Okay, so you want the real this. So, psi, so you've already figured out that psi r must stand for the real part of the eigenvector, and psi i must stand for the imaginary part of the eigenvector. Okay, and we are imposing the condition that only the imaginary part uh, has uh, a, a non-zero value. Okay, and what about the first two equations? Eigenvalue, like is that? 
psi r here is the real part of the so the eigenvector psi can be written as psi r plus i psi i. Those are vectors. So the eigenvector, when the eigenvalue is complex, the eigenvector will also have be complex, will have a real part and an imaginary part. So what we have done is for sigma, we want this to be equal to 0 plus omega uh, i. That is, I want the real part to be equal to 0. But I want the imaginary part to be non-zero. So that's where the omega gets in here. So what would be omega? What would be the meaning interpretation of omega? So if you if I have a solution that is e to the power sigma t, under that condition, what would it be? It would be e to the power omega, omega i omega i times t. That would be cos omega t plus i sine omega t. So omega is going to be the frequency of the oscillation, which is an unknown, but you can predict it because <laughs> omega is going to be identified as one of the material that you need to solve, one of the variables that you need to solve. So the variables that you would need to solve would be the vector x, the state vector, the parameter lambda, the parameter omega, and the vector psi i and the vector psi r. Okay, and this will have n components, this will have n components, this will have n components, this will have one, and this will have one. So the extended system is going to contain three n plus two equations. Okay, so these two are obtained by taking this eigenvalue problem. <coughs> J psi is equal to sigma. That is the eigenvalue problem. But split that into the real and imaginary part. And equate the real part, you'll get this. Equate the imaginary part, you'll get that. Okay, so take that equation. You, you can choose to do the calculations in complex arithmetic. Then you don't need to separate it. But if you choose the calculation, if you choose to use the calculations in real, then you need to split that. And when you split that, you get these two equations. Question? Both equations have the real and imaginary part of the yeah. vector. So but those are real numbers. Psi r is a vector. Psi r is a vector that contains only a real number. Psi i is a vector that contains only a real numbers. But they form the real part and the imaginary part of the complex vector psi. So this is the equation for the complex variable in the complex variable space for the eigenvalue problem. Okay. So what you need to do is, this is your eigenvalue problem. So take that and write it as psi r plus i psi i, okay, minus sigma times psi r plus i psi i equal to zero, and then separate the real and imaginary part from this, and th th you will get the other two equations. Okay. So the the extended system for the Hopf bifurcation. The size of it goes up tremendously by three times, three n plus two. Okay, and there are two parameters. One is what is the value of lambda when you have the Hopf bifurcation. The second one is when it occurs, what is the frequency of oscillation omega. You can also predict that. Okay, this is not an easy thing to do. Okay, when you are solving particularly hundred thousand equations, now all of a sudden you have three hundred thousand equations. So immediately there are very clever schemes that implement the LU decomposition in such a way that you still don't have to invert 300,000 equations. And we have, that's beyond the scope of uh, this course. But when you read a paper like this, you should be able to kind of decipher what they are doing. Okay? Admittedly, it will take you a lot of time to implement something like this in a real problem. And we are not yet at a stage where ComSol does it for us. So in your project, all I would expect you to do is understand the picture, Get the solution for one value and reproduce it from Comsol. Okay, I think we're almost out of time. Any questions on this? So we have two more papers to talk about. I'll do that in the next class, and then we'll start looking at the discretization processes. Ground zero again, okay? So we've finished the first part, where I've taken you from ground zero to the current literature in some sense, and now we'll see discretization 
sources of errors in the discretization, various types of discretization, using simple ordinary differential equations so that we understand the concept and the nuts and bolts of how to do it. Okay? But to do it on a real problem like this with navier Stokes is going to be time consuming, but not impossible to understand. That's the level I want you to take. But if you read a paper, you should be able to understand it. Uh, to do it, you need the time. All right. There are no questions. We will uh, stop there today. Any questions? Uh, online guys. Okay. So see you on... Uh, Wednesday, and if you have questions on your assignment or stuff, just email me if you want to fix up the time to discuss it. Okay? All right.